Uh, good morning. Can I welcome everybody to the sixth meeting of the Education and Culture Committee in 2015? And can I remind everybody that all electronic devices should be switched off? Uh, apologies have been received from Siobhan McMahon this morning. Um, our first item is for us to decide whether to take item three, which is consideration of a work programme in private. Are members agreed? Okay. That's agreed. Um, our next item is to complete our evidence taking on the British Sign Language Scotland Bill. This will be our final meeting for evidence taking, after which we will consider our stage one report. We have received a, a large amount of information on the bill, as members will be aware, including around 150 submissions, many of which were in BSL. We have also received hundreds of comments and views uh, of, of our uh, BSL Facebook group, uh, which now has um, reliably informed over 2,000 members. So. It's been a quite a successful um, exercise. Can I thank everyone who took the time to give us their views um, and also their comments on the bill? Um, I have to say that your comments are invaluable for the committee in, termining, in determining our ability to scrutinise the legislation. So can I thank everybody who provided comments to us uh, during our evidence gathering sessions? Um, this morning, can I welcome Alistair Allen, uh, Minister for Science, Learning and Scotland's Languages, and Hilary Third from the Equality Policy unit in the Scottish Government. Uh, welcome to you both. Um, but before I invite questions from uh, any members, um, I believe, Minister, you've got uh, some opening remarks to make. Thank you, Convener. Uh, yes, they're, they're brief, but uh, I'd like to thank you for the invitation to speak to you this morning. Uh, I'm happy to talk through the Scottish Government's position on Mark Griffin's bill, uh, which, as you know, uh, the Government supports in principle. And I also welcome the opportunity to talk through some of the changes which I think uh, improve it. But first, I hope you will allow me just to say a few words uh, about the fact that the Scottish Government recognises deafness as a culture uh, and British Sign Language very much as a language. We formalised this in a statement of recognition in 2011. And if you will permit me uh, to digress a little bit, uh, I just want to say that I personally am fascinated by the long cultural roots of uh, sign language in Scotland. Uh, I was fascinated to learn that Joan, the daughter of King James I of Scotland, not King James I of Britain, who died in 1493, was deaf, uh, and that she used some form of sign language at court, which was recognised officially and were, uh, was provided with interpreters. Um, so the reason I mention that is just to say that I recognise very much that we are talking uh, about a culture with uh, uh, a long pedigree here. I hope we can have a positive discussion today about the benefits of supporting British Sign Language. Um, too often we talk about BSL users only as recipients of public services, uh, and I want to pay tribute to the resilience and creativity of the deaf community in Scotland. I share the view expressed by some of the deaf witnesses who have given evidence to the committee that as a country we will benefit from their contribution uh, and if we protect, promote and support and value their language and their culture. The committee has heard first hand from BSL users in Scotland whose personal experience is often far from positive. As I understand witnesses have rightly pointed out, profoundly deaf people are covered by equality legislation and human rights conventions which do uh, define their disability. But the evidence suggests that despite these legal protections, their needs are still not being met. People who are profoundly deaf are often marginalised and excluded because they do not have linguistic access to information, services or to the opportunities and benefits uh, which many of the rest of us uh, take for granted. So I appreciate that the current picture is mixed. The committee, I understand, has also seen and heard evidence of some truly excellent work that's going on to promote and support the use of BSL, and I applaud uh, all of that. But I fear that uh, these may be the exceptions rather than the norm, and I do recognise that there is a lot more that we can and must do uh, across Scotland. As I've already said by way of conclusion, uh, the Scottish Government supports the principles of the Bill. As members will know, we have suggested some changes in the Government memorandum, and I'm delighted that Mark Griffin, in his earlier evidence session, indicated uh, he is supportive of these, uh, and we have been working with him to develop more detailed proposals. 
I believe these changes will simplify and streamline the requirements of the bill, uh, which will have the effect of reducing uh, any bureaucratic burden on public bodies, while at the same time making the legislation more action-orientated and outcome-focused. So uh, I look forward to sharing more of the detail uh, on our thinking on all of this and uh, look forward to hearing the committee's views. Uh, thank you very much, Minister. Um, I'm just going to go straight to questions, if you don't mind. I'm going to begin with George Adam. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Minister. Uh, a number of, I'd like to talk about promoting uh, BSL, and a number of organisations and BSL users have said that the bill, uh, there's two distinct reasons deaf people are not disabled, so disability legislation is not appropriate to meet their needs, and uh, they need to help and preserve BSL <coughs> as a language and a culture. Now, one of the things when we're talking about promoting when I look at it is I've been able to see the difference. Uh, I've been able to look at the practices within my own constituency office. How do I get training for my staff to, should a constituent come in? So that's the promotion from that point of view has made me look at how I uh, deal with my business practices because uh, I've got staff going to go into training. But one of the things I'd like to ask, Minister, is whether the bill is sufficiently clear in what is intended by the idea of promotion, specifically uh, who would be promoting BSL and, and how would we be doing that? Well, those are all very uh, uh, reasonable questions. Uh, I think the important thing about the, the bill uh, that Mr Griffin has provided and that we are seeking to amend uh, is that it leaves, to some extent, the answers to those questions in the hands of the deaf community themselves uh, in that uh, the advisory group that will be set up will very much uh, determine the, the content of the, the national plan uh, and I hope we'll have some influence on, on bodies around the country as to what their priorities are. The priorities shouldn't be set by politicians. But there are examples of things that I can think of that we could do better, that I'm sure will, will feature in the national plan. Um, they will be around wider public awareness of the existence of BSL, what it is, uh, uh, awareness of the fact that it, it is a language. It's not merely some means of signifying the English language. Um, uh, and also, I think it provides an opportunity for local authorities and others to think about what they can do uh, to provide better services. Um, it also, I think, uh, allows us to think more generally about education. We have a great opportunity uh, in the One Plus Two programme that the, uh, the government is promoting for, for modern languages in schools. It allows local authorities and others to think about where BSL uh, fits into that. Okay. Uh, you said, dear Minister, that obviously BSL is a language and it's recognised as such. Uh, are there any lessons that we could possibly learn from the Gaelic Language Scotland Act? Are there any examples there? Well, I, I know that Mr Griffin has, has looked at the 2005 Gaelic Language Act and it's informed some of his, his thinking around this bill. Um, as the Minister, um, with responsibility for day-to-day -day running, if you like, of the, of the 2005 Act, for Gaelic, uh, I can see the many benefits uh, that there have been for the language uh, in terms of uh, a much more coordinated uh, national approach to providing support to bodies which support the Gaelic language. I think perhaps the, the government amendments uh, that uh, are going to be forthcoming uh, learn also from the experience that uh, um, supporting a language is very importantly about plans, but it can't just be about plans. Uh, and, uh, and, as I say, are, are designed to try to ensure that uh, we streamline the process as much as we, as much as we can while keeping it effective. Okay, thank you. Can I push you a bit further, Minister, um, on the promotion? Now, I, I absolutely accept what you're saying about the deaf community taking the lead on, on many of these uh, issues and the group that's uh, planned to, uh, the advisory group that's planned to be set up. But, um, in the bill, it's at 1-1-A, the very first thing it says is the Scottish ministers are to promote et cetera, et cetera, the use and understanding of the sign language known as British Sign Language. So clearly, um, you know, there is a, a role for the, the, the Scottish ministers to promote, not just to facilitate promotion of by others. So I, I'm wondering what you said you have some thoughts. Could you maybe expand on that and give us what your thoughts are in terms of the Scottish minister's role in terms of your promotion of the DSL? Well, I agree. Clearly, uh, central government ha has a role, and that's, that's why the, the national plan uh, will be 
as I mentioned, informed by the deaf community, but the, the advisory group will advise ministers, and ministers will have to have a policy which they implement, and not only that they implement uh, for the Scottish Government, um, but uh, that will also apply to uh, the very many bodies uh, listed um, who are, are government bodies. So, for instance, um, that can involve uh, promotion work to explain, as I mentioned to the public, uh, the importance of BSL, uh, it can involve at a symbolic level, but an important symbolic level, uh, a recognition uh, of the fact that BSL is a language. But it can also uh, involve um, ensuring that our government bodies uh, and our government uh, keep constant track of what we are doing um, by way of promotion. Um, it, it ensures that there is a, a mechanism uh, by which we, we have to, to report back on, on action. Um, I think, as I've mentioned, one or two examples. I think there's much more we could be doing uh, and are doing in education, in schools. I think that there's much more that we, we can do and are doing uh, to challenge all of our public bodies around the provision of services, and I hope that uh, nationally ministers will be involved in all of that. Uh, Liam MacArthur. A brief follow-up. I mean, obviously, the evidence we've taken has, has drawn a distinction at times between um, the deaf community and the deaf-blind community. Uh, is, are, is there any observations you could make about whether or not the, the specific needs of the deaf-blind uh, community uh, would need to be kind of um, t taken apart from um, that of the, the deaf community as a whole? How would that be reflected in, in any um, promotional work uh, on behalf of either the Scottish Government or more widely amongst the, uh, other public authorities? Well, you're quite right uh, to say that obviously the, the needs of the deaf-blind community are very distinctive for very obvious reasons. Uh, and while the, the numbers uh, of people may involved may be smaller, uh, the, the needs that they have uh, are very uh, acute, very specific, uh, and uh, require one-to-one uh, -one, uh, design, really. Um, what I would say about where that fits with the bill uh, is that uh, I'm determined that the deaf-blind community will be uh, represented uh, directly on the advisory group. Uh, I accept that however this uh, bill is implemented, it must take uh, uh, account of the, the views of that community. I don't know if you want to say any more, if I may, uh, on that subject as well, convener. It's an important point. BSL, as the committee will appreciate, is a visual language, and deaf people who um, lose their sight will need a particular form of communication support so that they can continue to access the language. But as the minister said, I think any approach needs to be proportionate. Um, the numbers are very small, and the needs can be different from one um, person to the next. So we'd be committed to working with DeafBlind Scotland and others going forward to ensure that their needs are represented on the National Advisory Group and in the national plan. To suggest then that what will be um, referenced in the national plan is likely to be very, very overarching and, and, and in a sense almost reflecting the fact that this would almost need to be individually specific in its, in its nature. I, I would definitely see the, the national plan uh, making explicit reference to the deafblind community and the deafblind community would definitely be represented on the group. Um, given you've just said that, Minister, does the bill itself need to uh, reference in particular the deafblind community? Well, as I say, I'm, I'm giving an undertaking uh, here. Uh, I've as I've just indicated, my, my undertaking is that the deafblind community will be represented on the group, and there will be, as far as I'm concerned, uh, it would be very remiss, I think, uh, of anyone uh, not to have uh, explicit plans around the deafblind community. Uh, mentioned in the group. Whether that needs to be on the face of the bill, uh, I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure that uh, we, can, we can put everything on the face of the bill, but I, I'm giving that commitment today. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Chick Brody. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Minister. Um, I want to I may ask a question about the working group um, that, that uh, was established, but BSL and Linguistic Access Working Group. What has it actually achieved to date? Well, my, my view is that it's uh, achieved a great deal since, I think, 2000, when it was uh, established. Uh, it was established by the then Scottish Executive, and I, I would certainly want to pay tribute to, to the work it's done. I don't think we would have reached the point we're at today, where we're talking about legislation 
uh, giving status and rights uh, to the, the British Sign Language community uh, had it not been for the work they'd done to, to raise awareness, uh, had it not been for uh, work that they did in 2009 uh, around a, a roadmap which, uh, uh, which uh, facilitated, much, facilitated much of that. Uh, and as I say, I think uh, they've brought us to a point where it's now possible to have legislation. So uh, I would pay credit for that. So why would we need to establish a national advisory board? Well, I mean, is for this, is, does this complement the work? Does it replace the work? I mean, what is the difference between, you know, you, you just enunciated the achievements that the, the working group uh, has, has delivered. So why would we create a national advisory board? Well, I think one simple answer to that question would be uh, that I would like to see a body uh, which uh, is much more substantially composed of deaf people uh, and not taking away from anything I've just said about the importance of the work of the, the previous group. I think it's important that uh, any body that's at the heart of this new legislation should have a very substantial number of its, uh, or proportion of its members who are actual day-to-day -day BSL users who are uh, deaf people, uh, as I mentioned also specifically having some kind of representation on behalf of deaf blind people. And also this will have a, a very uh, um, different perhaps function. It will be there to produce uh, a national plan. Now, what that says about the previous group, well, it's, that's, that's for another day to discuss what the, the future perhaps of the, the previous group is. But this group has a, a specific function and also, crucially, it should be composed in a specific way. Again, with the convener's permission, I don't know if, if uh, uh, Hilary Third wants to add anything to that. So the intention going? If, if I could maybe pick that up. As the minister said, um, the group was set up by uh, the Equality Unit in 2000, so it's been running for 15 years, and I think like any group, it will have had its achievements, but there will be from time to time the need to review um, its function, its purpose, and its work going forward. I think the National Advisory Group that we've proposed um, is developed to support the imp implementation of the bill will have very specific roles which are quite different from the BSL and Linguistic Access um, Working Group. And it's important that the right people are around the table. As the Minister said, strong representation from deaf BSL users, but also um, some of the public bodies who will be subject to the bill. So, for example, COSLA doesn't sit on the group at the moment, and I think it will be important that they're on the group um, that helps to inform the national plan. Um, so I think that we feel it's important to create a group which absolutely fits um, the purpose for the implementation of the bill. It will be then for the BSL and Linguistic Access Working Group to consider what role it might have going forward, um, given that we will be in a very different context. Okay, thank you. Uh, if I may, just, just you talk about the national plan, um, and it's instructive that we have friends uh, here today in, in the audience. Uh, will you have someone with technical expertise to sit on the national plan? It seems to me that if for those that are, are not deaf, we have use of call centres, for example, and we had at previous sessions discussions around uh, the inability of if deaf people go into a surgery or they go into you know, local authorities uh, that the communication link is difficult. Um, and it would seem that there's absolutely no reason if we set up, set up the technology properly that we can't guarantee communication at that level between you know, various particular public bodies. So uh, will you ensure that there's some technical expertise, uh, technology expertise? I think, uh, I think that's a very relevant uh, point again because uh, I'm sure others like me have experience from their own constituencies of truly atrocious uh, situations uh, in terms of historically a, a lack of um, public services being available uh, to the deaf community uh, of people who have been unable essentially to visit their doctors with any sense of privacy. Uh, people who have uh, been uh, unable to uh, access, as you mentioned, anything that involves a call centre, as increasingly a lot of public services and, or private companies, I should say, uh, do involve. Uh, people who have been left quite isolated, particularly if uh, they're in rural communities where the, 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 
the community of BSL unit users is very scattered. And there are technical solutions which have been made available. Indeed, the government has uh, put quite a lot of money uh, into, uh, uh, I'm going to get the name wrong here, but video streaming, uh, Contact Scotland, Contact Scotland uh, which provides uh, a number of these services online. Good, thank you. I'd, as the Minister for Languages, I, would, I, I noted um, how delicately you skipped around the issue of the membership of the advisory group. Um, I, you'll be aware that some of the witnesses we've heard from um, are, are quite adamant that they see it as important that a majority of those in the advisory group uh, are drawn from the, the deaf community. Um, is that something that you would be um, happy to consider, uh, would support? Um, obviously, there are a range of, of different bodies who will, will need to be represented on that group, and it can't be un, uh, kind of unmanageably large. But nevertheless, it would seem to be an important principle to establish that the majority of the group is, is drawn from the, the deaf community. I certainly wasn't intending to be Delphic or oracular or anything else. Uh, I think, uh, as I gave an indication of, uh, I'm open to all ideas as to what the, the composition of the group should be. Um, but I certainly think that the composition of the group should be much more substantially uh, composed of the deaf community than uh, the, the previous uh, group that we, we referred to earlier on. Uh, I'm, I'm perfectly open to the idea of a majority. But the points that you make yourself are also relevant, which is that we need to have a range of uh, bodies represented. We need to have local authorities represented. We need to have service users represented. But yes, it should be in substan very substantial part, is all I can say at this stage, composed of deaf people. Thank you. Can I, Minister, just push you a little bit on the, this, this uh, previous group, the, the linguistic, or not previous, current group, the linguistic access working group. I mean, one, I mean, one of its roles was to improve linguistic access for deaf people in Scotland and to raise awareness of deaf issues. I mean, at the very least, there's an overlap between um, that group and the group that were, you're suggesting, the National Advisory Group. There may well be an overlap, and as, as we've talked about, it's, it's for that group and for the government to consider in future whether uh, uh, that overlap uh, would be sustainable or not. Um, but uh, I, I, do, I don't take the view that that group could be used to... Uh, uh, administer is probably the wrong word, but to, uh, to deal with certainly uh, uh, a piece of legislation uh, like this. I certainly don't think uh, we would design a, a group uh, that didn't have the numbers of, of deaf uh, people and BSL users on it um, that it should do, uh, nor I don't think we would, could we use a group which, which didn't include local authorities uh, who implement many of the services and would be dealing with many of the plans involved. Yeah. If you want to come in, if that's okay. If, if I could just make a further point, the BSL and Linguistic Access Working Group, when it was set up, was looking at um, wider forms of deafness, not just at profoundly deaf people who use sign language. So it covered sensory impairment and hearing loss as well. So really it was set up in a different time and for a different purpose. And as the Minister says, it doesn't have the representation of public bodies who would be subject to the bill. Uh, so I think it would be more difficult to redesign an existing group than to set up a new one um, with, a, with a, a good process in place to ensure that we um, have strong representation from um, deaf BSL users and not only those that occupy professional roles, but community members as well. I would accept that, but does, the counter-argument, in a sense, is not, it's not necessarily about effectively using the existing group to do the National Advisory Group's job, if you put it that way. Um, but doesn't the new group that you're about to design, design affect the National Advisory Group? Can that not be the group that effectively does not only the role that you envisaged in relation to the bill, but also the work that's currently undertaken by... The existing group. Yeah. Why do you need two groups? Well, as I, as I think uh, we're both trying to indicate here, you know, the, uh, the access group is there. No, none of these uh, groups exist uh, forever. None of them are in statute. Uh, these are things we would have to review, but it doesn't get away from the, the reality that, that we do need uh, a more formal uh, group to deal with the statutory responsibilities that this, this uh, bill would create. But yes, the, the government constantly does review the need for uh, the number of groups it has, this would be one of the things we would have to review. Could I okay, if, if I may, would, would it be okay for... 
Just one further point of clarification. The BSL and Linguistic Access Working Group is not a government group. Um, it's not chaired by or owned by the government. Um, and so it, it wouldn't really be for us to say that it shouldn't exist once we establish our own group. It was set up um, by the Government Equality Unit back in 2000, but we handed over the chairing to the Scottish Council on Deafness in 2011. So um, it wouldn't really be our place to say that that group should no longer exist once we establish the BSL National Advisory Group. I'll bring, I'll bring you on one second, check. So the government set it up. Do you fund it? We don't fund it. Right. We fund um, some of the organisations who are represented on it. Right. Okay, sorry. Check. Yeah, it, it's just in terms of promotion, it seems to me, uh, and I, I understand what, the rationale behind the creation of the working group, but in terms of promoting and promoting strongly, as I think we all agree that, that has to be done. You know, there's, is there not a great danger of the dilution of, of that promotion by having certainly two fairly significant bodies? Wouldn't it be better to, you know, well, sort of push this through I mean, one I, particular body that represents the challenge that we have? I mean, I, I don't want to um, go over old ground here too much, other than to say that you know, this, is a, this is a bill with, with very specific requirements uh, on government, uh, there needs to be uh, a body set up to, to deal with the very specific requirements of this piece of legislation. Um, as has been mentioned, uh, the access group is, is not chaired by the government. Um, that is a, a, a matter for another day. It's a matter we can certainly discuss. Uh, to some extent, it's not a matter for the government to, to dictate upon. Um, but I'm very firmly of the view that the group we need has to be a group which is set up in a way that includes deaf people much, much more substantially than the other group you refer to. Okay, thank you. Sorry, one, one final question before we move on, Minister, on this area. You just said that uh, we need this group to be established um, effectively to advise on the bill, or words to that effect. Uh, if if the, this group needs to be established in relation to the work of the bill, should it be on the face of the bill? Should the National Advisory Group be in the bill? Well, uh, my, my view is that the government is, is able to give undertakings about this. Uh, the committee can, can offer a view if they, if they feel it needs to be on the face of the bill. My, my view is that uh, it's not uh, required. Uh, the, we've set out of thinking about the, the role of the group uh, as a government. Uh, it's in the government's memorandum. Uh, and uh, we don't feel it's necessary for it to be on the face of the bill for those reasons. Uh, the committee may take a different view. Thank you very much. Um, Mary Scanlon. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have heard what you've said to other members of the committee about the National Advisory Group and the roadmap, but, uh, so I'm not asking you to repeat what's already been said. But I'm actually struggling to understand what powers ministers already have to promote uh, BSL. I'd like to understand what these powers have already achieved, let's say in the past eight years uh, since the government's been in power, uh, and what powers the bill would bring forward that are not currently available. I, I, I'm just not seeing that clearly at the moment. Well, um Probably some of the questions you have are, are probably ones you may want to, to address to the, to the mover of the bill in some ways. I'm happy to answer as many of them as I can. Uh, obviously, the government's role here, as we see it, is to, to improve a bill that's come from, from elsewhere. On your point about what the, the government has done so far without legislation or without specific legislation, uh, the government has been working very hard to support uh, BSL on a number of fronts. Um, we've closely worked with, uh, as has been mentioned, the BSL and Linguistic Access Group. Uh, there's also been funding uh, in a number of areas um, to support the infrastructure for teaching and learning of BSL uh, and to improve the engagement with the deaf community more widely. We've been, as I mentioned, enabling and encouraging schools to think about BSL as a subject alongside other modern languages. Uh, there has been funding to develop a pilot online interpreting pilot for BSL users, uh, particularly, as I alluded to, for uh, people who want to access public services by phone. 
Uh, and uh, again, at a symbolic level, in a ministerial uh, statement in 2011, uh, BSL was recognised as a language. So there are many things that we have been doing without this bill, um, but I would still take the view that the bill is helpful and for that reason that the government is able to support its principles. Okay, the question that you didn't answer is uh, what would the bill provide in terms of specific powers that you don't already have? In other words, what could you do when this bill is passed that you're unable to do now? I think uh, one of the things that the bill allows uh, that doesn't happen just now is it uh, ensures that all public bodies, both national and local, have to think about BSL. They have to think about the existence of BSL and services in BSL. They have to uh, make plans or produce statements about them uh, as organisations. These may be organisations which uh, haven't thought about this issue before. They'll have to think about it now. So that's a, a power that the, the bill creates that wasn't there before uh, and one that I think is, is helpful. Again, with the convener's uh, permission, I don't know if, if Hillary wants to come in on that as well. Uh, I think the... Oh, sorry. Okay. I think, I think the, um, the most important point, point is the one that the Minister has made about requiring other public bodies um, to um, set out what they will do to improve um, access to, to, to BSL across their services. Um, uh, I, think, I think that's really the key point here. I think government has a very good record, actually, on promoting and supporting BSL. There are a, n a number of very significant um, pro programmes of work that we've undertaken um, over the last few years. So um, I think we have a good record there, but the, the significant step really is about um, spreading that across the public sector, which will have a greater um, impact on deaf people across the country. Well... The, the main policy objective in the bill, in the policy memorandum, is to require BSL plans to be prepared and published by Scottish ministers and listed public authorities. Now, you've said that you're working hard with BSL groups, you're engaging, enabling, funding, uh, etc. And, you know, I want to do whatever is best to make BSL and access to BSL a success, but I'm actually struggling to, you know requiring a plan to be prepared and, you know, talking to public bodies, I mean, can you not just say to them just now, can you prepare a plan once a year and let's see what you're doing? Do you need the bill to ask them to prepare and publish a plan? Perhaps, perhaps bodies around the country are more likely to listen to uh, such a request uh, if uh, it's backed by legislation, but I think... Uh, the, the point that you, you make around plans, I can answer that in perhaps two ways. Um, firstly, as has been mentioned, the 2005 Gaelic Act, although it, it, it deals with other areas such as the implementation of policy, um, the, the encouragement of, of public bodies to produce language plans has actually changed the behaviour of a number of public uh, bodies in terms of, of provision around the Gaelic language. Um, but the, the other thing I would say in response to, to, to your, your question about plans and um, is, is this what's required, is to say that uh, we have worked uh, with uh, Mr Griffin uh, and with COSLA and others uh, to try to ensure that what we do on the, the plans front is proportionate. Uh, and I think it would be fair to say that uh, we've all, I hope, together reached the same conclusion, which is that some of this should be streamlined. And I don't know if that's where your question comes from, but we do, we do need to ensure that this isn't just about plans. Um, and that's why, for instance, the, the, uh, the number of plans uh, uh, within our amendments is, is greatly streamlined. There's a national plan. Uh, indeed, other organisations may make statements about their, their activities, uh, but we are not going down the route of having uh, uh, dozens upon dozens uh, of individual uh, plans for government bodies. Again, with your permission, I don't know if you want to say more about that. Um, uh, this is actually thinking that's developed since the government memorandum was published, so it's useful be to be able to spell it out um, for the committee. Um, what we're suggesting is that rather than requiring all national listed authorities to produce their own plans, that we produce a single national plan which covers all national public bodies that are um, answerable to Scottish ministers. 
we think that this would allow us to take a much more um, strategic and coordinated approach in terms of the actions that need to happen at the national level. And it also reduces the, the, the number of plans that need to be produced and consulted on, um, therefore reducing the burden across the public sector. So we feel that this would be a better approach, both in terms of the, the quality um, or the, the, the outcome, um, but also the bureaucracy involved in producing such a plan. So I think that's quite um, an important change um, that we are proposing. You see, by the colour of my hair, I've sat here and passed quite a lot of legislation over since 1999, and it's not the plans or the legislation, but it's the implementation that really concerns me. So I'll just lump my uh, wind-up questions together. So let's say one of your listed uh, public authorities... Uh, let's say after five years, they didn't take any actions, didn't do anything. So, you know, what happens then? What if people just uh, give you nice warm words, cosy words in your national plan, we intend to make progress, which could be minimal or, or huge. But basically, what if they do nothing? What kind of sanctions have you got? What, you know... Uh, how, how do you make sure that this moves things forward? And can I just, given that you're also Minister, the, Minister for Gaelic, and I'm a Highlands and Islands MSP, uh, I mean, I just applaud the huge advances in Gaelic and the access to Gaelic, and, you know, it's just absolutely incredible. But Mark Griffin is on the record as saying uh, he, uh, he wants BSL... Uh, on an equal footing with Gaelic. So could I maybe just ask for a piece of advice from you? What more needs to be done? Because this bill doesn't put BSL on an equal footing with Gaelic. In your opinion, what more needs to be done to get BSL on an equal footing with Gaelic? So only two questions. And the first one is, what if people ignore your national plan? What do you do then? And secondly, uh, equality with Gaelic. OK. On, uh, on the first point, um, obviously we're, we're starting in terms of legislative status from quite a, a low base uh, for BSL um, to all of our shames. Uh, and I think that uh, the emphasis on, in the bill as presented and as our proposed amendments take it is very much upon carrots rather than sticks. But it is relevant to say that uh, um, bodies do have to provide some kind of statement uh, as to uh, regularly as to how they are uh, progressing with uh, uh, measuring up, living up to uh, the national plan. Um, and there will be the opportunity, and I'm sure uh, the community will take it, um, to offer an opinion uh, if, if uh, bodies are not living up to that. In terms of uh, the, the point about the status of Gaelic, well, of course... So if, if they say they're going to do something and one, two or five years later they haven't done anything, you will offer an opinion? Well, they, they will have to provide uh, statements as to whether or not they are uh, living up to the, uh, the principles of the, the national plan. Uh, and that, uh, while I absolutely accept, uh, is not legislative sanctions, perhaps, of the kind that, that the member is, is talking about. It is, nonetheless, it is nonetheless progress on where we are just now, where there's no um, requirement... Uh, upon uh, public bodies in any formal sense uh, even to think about the language issues around BSL at all. On, on the second question uh, around uh, language status and, and comparisons with Gaelic, uh, of course, uh, at the moment, English doesn't have official status in Scotland. Uh, Scots has no uh, defined status. Uh, Gaelic has some legal status through the 2005 Act. Um, but the, if you like, official status um, of Scotland's indigenous languages is, is largely unresolved, I should say. Um, the, the sympathies I have uh, are very much around ensuring that all language communities uh, make progress. I believe this bill, although it doesn't come from the government, it ensures that progress is made with the status of BSL. Okay, thank you. Um, just one point on the, the, the duties that Scottish ministers may have. 
Can I ask about the – there was um, a proposal, effectively, that uh, uh, a minister would have direct responsibility for BSL. Um, the government's committed to do this, and I believe Mark Griffin has suggested at least that the, that provision could be deleted from the bill. I think that's my understanding of where the discussions went to. However, if that provision on ministerial responsibility for BSL was to be deleted, how would the link between BSL and a specific ministerial portfolio, portfolio be guaranteed in the future? Well, at the moment, uh, obviously, as Minister for Languages, I have uh, the responsibility, and I think in any circumstances, uh, a minister would take lead responsibility on uh, BSL. Uh, the reason I think there's, or uh, my understanding is that there's certainly consensus on this point. Um, uh, the reason behind that is because the government, as you'll appreciate, operates on a basis of collective responsibility. Uh, we, we simply don't have on the whole legislation which, um, on, a, on the face of legislation, uh, identifies the government's responsibility as sitting with a particular minister uh, in the legislative formal sense. We have collective uh, government responsibility. But that doesn't take away from the fact that, as Minister for Languages, I will be the person leading on this, uh, and that will be the case in, in future governments, I'm sure. Liam McArthur. Yeah, we're we'll just about to come on to the, the issue of the, um, I think the financial memorandum and some of the, the implications that, that flow from that. But I was interested in the comment that um, was made by Mr. Dare about um, <coughs> trying to streamline the process. And I think there has been um, obviously concerns about the amount of resources that are expended on the, the drawing off of plans and statements, etc., as opposed to the frontline delivery of, of, of services. But nevertheless, Minister, earlier in your comments, you were saying, uh, I think in response to Mary Scanlon, that, that where this takes us from where we are at the moment is it, it, it places a, a requirement on public authorities to produce a plan or a statement. But if I understood correctly from what Ms Third was saying, that in streamlining the process, in the sense they all come under an umbrella of a, of a single plan, the ownership of that statement or that plan, if you like, would it at the best be diluted. And, and, and in some senses, you could see authorities saying, well, that's a national plan, and really it doesn't have as much to do with us as a statement of, of intent, which would be very much drafted, owned, consulted on by the, um, the, the, the public authority or the, the relevant authority. Let me be clear, when I'm talking about public bodies in that context that would come under the, the national plan, these would be national government bodies, so there is a connection there in the, in, in the first place anyway. Um, and there would be, uh, there is a reasoning, I think, behind uh, streamlining uh, the bill in that way. Uh, let me give you some examples. If we did have dozens upon dozens of consultation processes um, for dozens and dozens of, of government bodies, uh, around individual uh, plans around BSL, uh, I think we could very quickly get ourselves into a, a state of gridlock, given the, the, the pressures on relatively small deaf communities, given the lack of BSL interpreters. Obviously, we want all these government bodies to be involved, but I, I personally don't think it makes sense for us to have, for some of the reasons I think possibly without putting words in our mouth, Mary Scanlon was alluding to, I don't think we need to replicate the process endlessly. I mean, I think that's fair, but I, I think it's also um, highly likely that the specific issues that the, the deaf community may have with different agencies of government are going to be different, um, whether in a nuanced sense or whether in a substantive sense. And therefore, a national plan that is able to reflect that so that whatever the organisation is has ownership of it and indeed probably the priority of where um, the action points sit are slightly different um, for each of those organisations need to be reflected. Otherwise, it becomes a kind of um, a homogenous um, plan that, 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 that that, that people can um, duck out of, of, of helping deliver, or play their part in delivering. Well, the, that, these are, are, are reasonable observations, and for that reason, the, the statements which will be provided by these uh, government uh, bodies or these public bodies will be flexible enough uh, to, to take account of the fact that the, the plan may have to be interpreted in an entirely different way uh, within, or a, in, to some extent, a different way within Creative Scotland to within Skills Scotland. Uh, to pick examples, two examples of bodies which are not currently listed, which we'd like to see listed. I don't know if you are able to say any more about that. Yeah, I think the other point is that um, our suggestion is that one of the first tasks for the BSL National Advisory Group would be to um, develop agreed national priorities. 
uh, and to an extent they would determine what some of the actions would be for different um, national bodies and then that would be reflected as part of the plan. Okay, thank you. Um, Colin Beattie. Thank you, Vera. Minister, I'd like to carry on with the, uh, this question of the, the plans, because it's a core feature of the bill that uh, the requirement that Scottish ministers and the various listed authorities produce plans and consult on the drafts with BSL users and others. Now, the cost of how, how will public authorities meet the costs that would be contained within any recommendations that came up within these plans? Would they be expected to meet that out of their own resources? Well, uh, it should be said that some of the, the cost things uh, in circulation, for instance, the, the figure of uh, six million over the four-year period uh, for the, the implementation of the bill, uh, some of these uh, cost things refer to the bill uh, in fact, all of these costings refer to the bill as presented rather than the bill in the form that I would prefer to see it amended. Uh, I think some of what we can do uh, along the lines that I've just mentioned about streamlining the number of, of plans uh, does take us some way towards reducing some of the, the bureaucratic costs. Uh, and that's one of the areas that uh, uh, COSLA has been, I think, uh, uh, been a very positive, I think, um, conversation we've had with COSLA around some of that. Um, but I, I do think that uh, the, the issue of whether there are additional resources required to implement the bill, um, I mean, just to turn that on its head, uh, obviously there are additional costs at a personal level and at a societal level, but also for local authorities uh, if we don't get this right. I think one of the, the consequences of public bodies and local authorities not having to think in a, a more formal sense about services for deaf people is that deaf people are left behind in a way that creates a cost to society through the cost to them personally in terms of educational opportunities, the attainment gap uh, that they face, the employment problems that they face. Again, I don't know if you want to come in on some of that. Um, I think, as the Minister says, some of our suggestions are designed to reduce the cost to... Um, the, the Scottish Government and its agencies um, and also to local authorities but our costings are based on the bill as published and not on the bill and our suggested amendments so maybe that some further work needs to be done on that Thank you um, Given that the plans are crucial do you, do you have any uh, specific items that you would expect or want to see included in the national plan or the local plan? Well, as I've indicated, uh, I don't want to speak for the deaf community. They will, they will speak, I hope, uh, within the, the advisory group very clearly. Um, but the kind of things that I can imagine being priorities, which I certainly think are priorities, are some of the things I've just mentioned. At a symbolic level, the recognition uh, of the, the, the role and the importance and the linguistic status of BSL. And at a practical level, what we all do as public authorities to ensure uh, that the opportunities for deaf people improve, because uh, I would certainly recognise that the opportunities for deaf people have not been what they should have been, um, that there is an attainment gap uh, in our education system. I regularly meet deaf people who talk about uh, the fact uh, that... Uh, they don't feel that their, their needs were considered uh, fully by all of us as uh, public authorities when it comes to uh, promoting careers and jobs and uh, the opportunity to gain qualifications uh, for deaf people. Um, I feel that there's much more that could be done in the wider community to recognise the role that uh, BSL could play amongst non-deaf people uh, in promoting understanding. These are all areas that I'm sure will be discussed and all areas that I'm sure will be reflected uh, in the advice that comes to me. But the advice is, is not a matter for me. Clearly, the, the national plan will highlight the overarching priorities and authorities that are, that are participating in this will, will feed into that. Will there be uh, sufficient flexibility that if there's a need on a local basis to deviate 
from the national priorities, given the fact that uh, you know local circumstances can be different from area to area. Will that will that uh, capability to deviate be included in the uh, in the bill? Uh, yes, I mean I think that uh, some of the priorities set out uh, in the uh, national plan uh, will, as you say, be less relevant to some local authorities uh, or listed authorities rather than others. Uh, and so, yes, there should be scope for them to determine how to respond to that. Uh, and it may be, for instance, that uh, the National Advisory Group can offer advice to groups or bodies or authorities around the country, uh, perhaps even almost templates, uh, as to how their own uh, statements uh, could be put together. Um, but uh, definitely, as I've, as I've indicated, there has to be scope for those statements to reflect the actual function of those different bodies, they have to be flexible enough to do that, and they have to be flexible enough to realise that deaf people will engage with those authorities in completely different ways. And just, just one last question. Should it be a requirement that uh, the listed authorities are consulted on the national plan? Um, my understanding is from the government memorandum, and I'll refer here to Hilary Third, that there is reference to uh, conversation between government and listed authorities around that. I don't know if you can add any more to that. Yes, I think we would um, anticipate um, a very um, participatory process in developing the BSL national plan. Um, it would need to involve, as we've said, a wide range of interests that would be around the table at the BSL national advisory group, but also would need to reflect the views of the much wider community, both in terms of, of deaf people and a wider range of public bodies than can fit around that table. So um, I anticipate that quite a lot of our work in the first um, period after the bill has passed, once we've established the group, will be on, on engaging and consulting around the national plan. And clearly, if it covers a whole range of national bodies and has implications for local um, authorities and for health boards, um, we will need to ensure that they are content with um, and sign up with the agreed national priorities and that's an important point that COSLA has made that if, if, if it's going to be um, acceptable to and meaningful for local authorities they will need to be part of the process of agreeing the national priorities so I, I see a lot of engagement around the development of the plan which is why um, we're suggesting um, a sort of post-government memorandum that perhaps the government needs to have longer to uh, publish its first national plan than the year that's set out in the bill, um, because just the process of setting up the BSL National Advisory Group in the right way, I think, will take time, and it's very important that the first national plan is right and involves a, a wide range of interests, so um, that, that, that's something else that, that we would like to suggest. Uh, supplementary from Liam MacArthur. Um, I, I listened to what you were saying, Minister, about the, the, the costing estimates being a, a reflection of what was in the original, or what is in the original bill, and, and not necessarily what would emerge um, on the basis of what appear to be very constructive discussions between the government uh, and, and Mark Griffin. I think this is my first members' bill uh, scrutiny process, and I, I, I'm interested to observe that while <laughs> I'm interested to observe that while financial memos that come before us with government bills tend to be an exercise in trying to reassure us that the costs being kept to an absolute minimum, in this instance it looks like the kitchen sink has been rather thrown at it. And I, I note the costs to Scottish government um, are estimated to be up to 140,000 a year in the first year and 100,000 thereafter. And I just wonder whether this is, falls into the same category as uh, telling us that every parliamentary question costs however many hundreds of pounds, whereas actually these are answered by civil servants signed off by ministers and we don't add to the number of civil servants um, just because we ask uh, more parliamentary questions. So I, I appreciate these aren't necessarily the figures that will emerge um, in, in a finalised financial memorandum. But it would, be, it would be helpful to get a better understanding quite where these figures emerge from, not least because in response to the, answer, to the question from Mary Scanlon earlier on, from the Scottish Government perspective, the bill's not requiring or empowering you to do much beyond what you're already doing anyway, and it's more that the, the responsibility it places on other public authorities. I'm not sure that's supplementary on the plans, um, and we are, Gordon MacDonald was going to lead off on, on the financial. Um, I thought he was doing on the financial one. So this, is, I, this has all been prearranged. No, 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 no. no. Oh, well, we, we do talk to each other, Minister. You know, I'd be surprised to know. You remember being a committee member, surely. Anyway, um, uh, I don't know whether you want to come in at this stage or do you want to wait till the. Oh, 
Well, the, the only follow-up I would ask, bearing in mind that most of the, the aspects of the financial implications have been touched upon, is, um, is there any estimate of the cost of implementing the actions set out in the plans? Because it's all talking about the preparation of the plans, but there is no, doesn't seem to be any estimate of the cost of actually carrying out the actions set out in the plans. So is there an estimate? No, the, there isn't. The, the figures uh, that we've, we're referring to here uh, is that it is, as um, uh, Mr MacArthur said, this is the, the government's estimates of the costs associated with the uh, original bill as tabled, uh, £6 million over four years. Uh, but no, it doesn't, it doesn't take us into, into the areas you're talking about. It's, it's just the cost directly associated uh, with the bill. Um, I mean, for instance... Uh, my understanding is uh, that the member hopes that the obligations under the bill uh, will in practice lead to an increase uh, to the services uh, made available uh, in terms of BSL by public authorities. But uh, uh, the financial memorandum doesn't attempt to quantify some of the things you're talking about, no. And, and if there was to be increased services um, to BSL users in a, on the back of this bill, it will require additional resources. So are there any additional resources coming from government in order to cover this? Well, I mean, one of the conversations that, that we've had to have uh, with COSLA and that we've been very happy to have with COSLA is around some of the, the issues of the role of local government in all this, uh, as well as the, the role of, of national uh, bodies. Um, I, I come back to my point, and it's not meant to be evasive, but it's an important point. I come back to my point, which is that um, although this isn't the government's bill, we are supportive of its, of its principles, and the, the reason, or one of the reasons that we're supportive of its principles is because I think there is a, a false economy associated with not doing something for this, this group of people. Um, that's, that might sound like a general answer, um, but as I say, um, to, be, to be clear, the, the bill doesn't, doesn't deal with implement, or the bill's costings don't deal with, with implementation along the lines you've mentioned. Thanks. You okay, Gordon? Yeah, I'm fine. You okay, Liam? <laughs> I think we, in a sense, we've gone beyond the the, uh, the, the submission on the on the costings. Yeah. I, I just I, I was intrigued that the approach to the costings of the members' bill appeared to be a slightly different approach to the the, the financial memorandum process for for a government a government bill. And it'll be interesting. Whether I mean I don't know whether the government plans to come forward at a later stage with estimated costs, or whether the expectation would be that the the proposer of the bill would be expected to do that. But it would certainly be interesting in a sense. We can ask them. Okay. Um, Chick Brody. Yes, just coming back to the, the, the national plan and the flexibility that, that uh, appears to be being encouraged uh, as to its interpretation at local level, uh, on the basis that I abhor the notion of targets, can you tell me uh, what outcomes you expect a, the national advisory body to a monitor and how will they determine a meaningful performance of view of progress and improved outcomes? Well, um, for instance, when we have statements uh, produced by local authorities, um, I don't think it would be appropriate for ministers to be in the business of, of monitoring, as it were, the, the advisory body, which in these circumstances would have to be fairly robust. Uh, in, indeed, uh, but what I'm saying is that, for instance, uh, when it comes to the NAC, when, it, when, when uh, local authorities produce um, statements, uh, it wouldn't be appropriate, is what I'm saying, for the, the national advisory body or the government uh, to be monitoring, as it were, what, what the local authorities do. Um, when it comes to uh, national bodies, obviously there will be that connection with the government, and we would be wanting to see that their statements were robust We'd be wanting to see that their statements showed that they wanted to live up to the national plan. Um, but I'm sorry to interrupt, but I'm now confused because there's a national plan which we want to achieve nationally. I know uh -huh. integral parts of that uh, reside with the, with the local authorities. But somewhere somebody has to make a, a review of a performance which ensures that we are improving outcomes. Well, if... 
if Parliament, or indeed if the, the movers of the bill wanted to create a, a bill which, which gave powers and gave a, a mechanism for perhaps, uh, perhaps the kind of monitoring system that, or monitoring of progress system that the member has in mind, that would be an option for Parliament. But that's, that's not uh, what's in the, the, the bill. The bill is much more uh, about encouragement, much more about carrots than about sticks. Um, the original bill talks about performance review. Um, the, uh, the government's uh, stance on that uh, is that uh, it's, we, we would like to see that altered in some ways. Uh, amendments will reflect that. Um, and uh, again, I might, uh, might defer to yourself, Hillary, about some of the, the changes that are being proposed to the, the bill in that area. Yeah. Um, so, as the Minister said, the bill as published requires Scottish ministers to publish a performance review um, and that uh, would include an account of the measures taken, outcomes attained and highlight examples of best practice and poor performance. But as the Minister says, we, we, we're suggesting that we change that provision slightly and that rather than talking about reviewing performance, we instead have a, a performance, uh, sorry, um, a progress report, which might sound like um, um, just a, a, a change of language, but actually there's an important um, implication here. Firstly, um, it's very difficult to carry out a performance review in a situation where there is no baseline and there are no performance indicators in place to uh, measure performance. Secondly, um, as the Minister's already said, we've, we've heard from COSLA, um, who are strongly of the view that it's inappropriate um, for Scottish ministers to, to assess their performance and that they are instead accountable to their local communities. Um, so for that reason, we've suggested that, that, um, that ministers should publish a publish a progress report which sets out um, the national picture, gives a, a flavour of some of the activities um, that are taking place, but it would be different from a performance review um, because we accept that it's not appropriate for uh, Scottish ministers to judge the performance of local authorities. Um, however, we, we are thinking that over time it would be possible to build in an assessment of national impact and also that each um, progress report would set out recommendations both at a national and at a local level um, for further improvements. Sorry, can I just, just briefly, uh, I don't accept that. I mean, yes, we don't have a baseline. That doesn't mean to say that we don't choose some time once, you know, maybe in the bill or uh, as to when we say that we, we will determined by local authority just exactly what the baseline is and then measure their uh, performance improvement against that. But at the end of the day, we have a responsibility to the people to, to, to influence uh, the, the change in this particular area. Uh, and I'm surprised that if one local authority just doesn't pay any attention to the or doesn't pay any attention, but does not follow a, follow a national plan, who then ensures that they do follow. The point there would be that local authorities democratically and publicly have to answer for their actions, but they, they do have to report on progress, as do national bodies. If they don't meet that, if they, if they are clearly not living up to um, the principles of the national plan, if they're not able to report on substantial progress, then not only will they have to answer to that publicly, but they'll certainly have to answer to the deaf community for it. Liam MacArthur? Did you want? I, I, yes, I think Chick Brodie's just into my question on performance review, what I did to Gordon MacDonald on uh, financial memorandum. <laughs> he who lives by the sword, so to speak. Um, I, just, I mean, following up that point in relation to the, the performance review, I mean, the evidence we've had um, are that uh, sort of expectations against centrally imposed targets isn't necessarily or is of questionable value. And the democratic accountability point, the Minister, that you made, uh, I think very fairly, would, would be one I'd adhere to. But there does appear to be, um, at best, Apache, but um, some may say um, a complete absence of, of, of data about performance in this area. Um, so is there, is there anything through this bill or anything the government uh, is committed to doing that gives confidence that, that the data around performance uh, across the kind of public realm can be monitored over a period, whatever the, whatever the baseline is, so that the advisory group has something with which to, to, to presumably work? Well, I think um, there is a lack of a baseline. I would hope that in time... Uh, 
this bill would contribute to the, the gathering of, of better information about services around the country and services provided by, by public authorities, I would hope that over time that that, that would lead to a culture of improvement. From, again, we keep going back to the, to the um, Gaelic Act in 2005. Is there anything from that experience and that process that would perhaps inform the way in which we, we try to chart the progress that's being made um, through this bill? The, the Gaelic Act of 2005 uh, is, is set up on a, a slightly different basis in that, for instance, implementation forms part of the legislation uh, and that the legislation set up uh, a, a formal body, Board na Gaelic, um, which, as well as having an implementation role, was actually uh, involved in the funding of bodies. It was a different, a different kind of uh, beast in that respect. Um, so I'm not sure you could make direct comparisons, no. Right. But again, if I could just add, um, we have started to map local provision and need um, through a project that we funded um, over the last two years through Scottish Council on Deafness, the Equality and Access for Deaf People project, which has, um, has three project offices that have been working with public bodies and with local deaf communities to start to build the picture. Um, and we will be building on that programme of work um, and supplementing that programme of work going forward so that we will, I believe, during the course of the first cycle, develop a much better picture of provision and need. I mean, it occurs to me as we're going through this in, in response to the earlier questions from, from, from Chick Brodie that I think all the way along we've been conscious of the, 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 uh, the need to manage expectations about what this bill will do and what it won't do. Is, is there a risk in, in referring to performance review that actually the perception of what will be achieved through this um, is, is likely to be very different from what actually um, public authorities and the advisory group are, are, are likely to be able to achieve through it? Well, I suppose, to, to some extent, you know, this is why changes are, are being proposed by the government in this area, to make sure uh, that there isn't a, a mismatch between the, the language of the, the bill and the, the reality, but also to make sure um, that there is a, a culture developed of, of bodies reporting back on, on actual progress uh, against what uh, they've set themselves as, uh, as the, their priorities and what the national plan has set as priorities for them. So it's, it's, the aim of it is to become much more action-focused. Foc uh, uh, the aim is to ensure that, that bodies uh, are setting themselves a, a to-do list of things that they can practically achieve uh, and that those things will be visible and, and understandable and, and can be commented on readily by the community. Okay. Um, can I just ask the Minister about the cycle for publishing BSL plans? I mean, clearly um, there's a, 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 a process by which that's supposed to be done contained within the bill, um, and uh, the government takes a different view um, on it. Could you maybe explain your reasoning for being opposed to the, the way that it's being proposed in the bill? Well, the, there's a couple of things. Uh, firstly, um, when we're talking about the timescales, uh, uh, the initial bill is, is talking about five years, uh, and uh, again, that refers back, I suppose, or the, the inheritance that comes from is from the, the 2005 Gaelic Act. Uh, I'm not sure if I can use the analogy about the fourth railway bridge anymore since they use stronger paint, um, but uh, I think it would be fair to say and that without taking away from the importance of, of Gaelic uh, plans, that, the, that Borna Gaelic, the whole body set up partly to, to administer these plans, finds that no, no sooner has it uh, uh, concluded and monitored a plan than it, it's, it's returning to the, the same body's plan over again. So I'm not 100% convinced that five years is, is the right period. Um, we suggested seven. Um, I think it may end up being six in the government's eventual amendments. Um, but the other thing to be said, and I'll ask Hillary to say more about this, is that the, the timescales in the original bill are all focused around the parliamentary cycle uh, in quite a complex way, which I do think needs to be simplified to be workable. Yeah. Um, the advice from our um, solicitors is that the way that it's set out in the bill as published is quite complex. Um, and that it would be more straightforward to set the timescale in, in terms of number of years. Um, so, so, in fact, I think the original proposal would have worked out even closer to four years, which, given that the experience of the, of the Gallic Act is that five years was really quite tight, um, that was the reason for suggesting the seven years. I think it's important to note that... Um, 
the, the, that the action, the expectation is that actions will be being taken between the period of the, the plan being published um, and the performance review or the progress report taking place. I think there's been some anxiety from some of the deaf witnesses that, that nothing happens between those periods, whereas our feeling is that that's where all the activity should happen. And we want to focus as much of the resource as possible on the actions rather than the reporting um, process. But as the Minister said, we've, we've heard what many deaf witnesses have said and concerns about seven years being too long. Um, and so, as the Minister said, we're we're, we're thinking perhaps that the amendment should be for a six-year cycle, but that within that, um, we allow that the government is allowed two years to develop the first national plan for the re reasons that I outlined earlier. Okay, thank you much. I've got one final question, which is on the actual uh, list of the uh, bodies, um, which is it's Schedule Two, I think it is. Yeah, in the bill. Um, I just wondered on the government's view, first of all, whether or not the, there should be a list contained within the bill. Um, rather than separately. Um, and secondly, if it was to be contained within the bill, um, at the moment it says that it can be amended by an order under subsection 3, which is sub subject to the affirmative procedure. So I just wondered whether or not you thought that was the appropriate level of procedure for any list contained in the bill to alter it. And as I say, uh, my first question was on whether or not such a list should be contained in the face of the bill in the first place. I think it's useful for a list of bodies to be there and in the schedule, uh, but I think it's useful for it to be something that's amendable by the process you've just described rather than by the whole uh, process of primary amendment or amendment to primary legislation um, by the, the long parliamentary route. But I think it is quite an important signal to, to set out that uh, there should be a list of bodies, but we have, a, we have amended the list of bodies. We have changed the list of bodies from, from that originally supplied uh, in Mr Griffin's bill, um, because, as I've mentioned, there are important ones that are left out in our view. Um, my second question was, was really whether or not you agreed that the, it should be by the affirmative procedure, or do you think the negative is sufficient? Or I, I, think the, I think the affirmative procedure is, is proportionate if we were in the future seeking to, uh, to amend the list of bodies, if a new body came into being, if a body went out of being. I think that's a proportionate way to try to amend it. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Minister. Thank you for your attendance this morning. Uh, we appreciate your time. Um, we will be moving on to hear from the member in charge of the bill, Mark Griffin, now. Um, so I'll suspend briefly.
Uh, can I welcome uh, to the committee this morning Mark Griffin, um, who, although as a member of the committee, is here, of course, as a member in charge of the bill. So, uh, welcome, uh, Mark. Uh, I, obviously, we also have your supporting officials from the Scottish Parliament, uh, Joanna Hardy from the Non-Government Bills Unit, and Neil Ross, Principal Legal Officer. Uh, welcome to both of you as well. Um, can I, before we go to questions again, can I invite Mark to make an opening statement? Mark. Okay. Thank you, Convener, for giving me a, another chance to come and um, give evidence to the committee. I have been um, following the, the evidence sessions and I think the fantastic Facebook um, group that has been set up and seen uh, the massive quantity of evidence that has been submitted. I think that has been um, really encouraging. I will just briefly set out that the, re the reasons that I brought forward a, a British Sign Language Bill, partly, pe partly personal. Um, I have two great grandparents who are, who are deaf blind um, and I was brought up hearing stories of how they raised their children and how they accessed services um, with that dual sensory impairment. And when I became an MSP and joined the Cross Party Group on Deafness, um, disappointed really to hear the experiences um, of people in the Cross Party Group on Deafness almost three generations later um, experiencing the same, the same difficulties, having the same difficulties in, in access to services, the same difficulties with appreciation of the language and, and the culture um, of BSL, difficulties with um, accessing medical advice, uh, the police service, um, difficulties with educational attainment that, again, still existed three generations later than the stories I was hearing about how my great um, grandparents um, lived their life. Um, so that, that's really my motivation for, for bringing this bill in, in front of you today. I think there is an appetite for, for legislation through the consultation. Um, there was an overwhelming appetite um, for legislation um, to give um, British Sign Language, to put British Sign Language on a, an equal footing, and not to say a, a, a legal footing, but um, certainly presentationally in um, how Scotland treats its language that BSL has put on a, a similar footing to the, the Gaelic Language Act, one of our um, other Indigenous languages. And I think that's come over loud and clear, I think, in the evidence sessions from um, BSL users and the submissions through the Facebook page that, that legislation um, really is, is required. Um, at this stage, I'm, I'm in discussions with the, the government about their range of amendments, and I'm open to, to all of those um, coming forward, and we'll take a, a more detailed look at them when they're tabled, and I'm um, happy to take um, all of the members' questions today. Okay, uh, thank you very much for that, Mark. Um, I'm going to move straight to George Adam. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Mark. Uh, one of the main parts of the bill, one of the biggest issues that's come up and one that the deaf community is interested in is the fact that the promotion of BSL within the bill, the fact that it will be uh, regarded as a, well, already is regarded as a, a language in its own right. But uh, one of the main parts of the bill, and something that's always in my mind, is the fact that how I represent my own constituency. And uh, I've already spoken to some of my staff about trying to get them to actually learn uh, the, some rudimentary sign language as well, so we can represent our constituency. And what my question is, Mark, is how do you see the bill actually taking that a step further? Because it's obviously affected me, because I've seen the evidence, I've seen what's happened when we've been going through this. How do we ensure that other organi public organisations and other, uh, uh, other kind of bodies we promote the bill. How, how do you see that happening? Yep. Obviously, the, the promotion part, that's an obligation on the Scottish Minister, so that will be for the, the government to decide as to how they go about um, promotion of the language. But I think, um, reflecting on what you're saying, um, that's exactly what I hope will happen um, in the minds of decision makers and public authorities right across, <coughs> across the country, that when they come to um, drafting their own um, statements or, or BSL plans that they will actually go down the same thought process as yourself and think how are, how are we supposed to provide a service to um, our constituents, um, our, the, the taxpayers, 
that rely on our services? How are we going to provide the same level of service that anyone else around the table expects and, and has a right to? Um, so I think through those, those plans, that will start um, the decision makers actually <coughs> setting the, the ball in motion and, and continuing from the actions that you have described that you're going to be carrying out in your own constituency office. Uh, so we're looking at a cultural change, uh, looking at a way to, to move things forward from that. But what uh, you know, we asked the minister. Obviously, there's some mention of the Gaelic language bill, and you've used it as a template almost. Uh, how do you see that learning from what's happened with that can help to make sure that things actually uh, work from the get-go? I mean, we heard from the minister um, exactly how the Gaelic language had, had benefited, how the use of awareness um, of Gaelic had, had benefited from an act in a, national, um, a nationally coordinated um, language plan that the use and understanding of, of an awareness um, of Gaelic had really increased. And that's, um, I would hope that that would also um, happen with BSL, um, some of the the lessons that have been learned of, from the Gaelic Language Act, the minister and officials have been talking to me about how um, we go, go around amending the British Sign Language Bill to take into account the previous lessons learned on things like um, the length of cycle um, and other issues that we can learn les lessons from the Gaelic Language Act. That was really the, the sort of model um, that had built um, the BSL Bill on. So it, Obviously, it makes sense that for people who have experience um, with that previous language act, that I would learn lessons and, and amend accordingly. Thank you, um, Mark. Could you define what is intended by promotion? I haven't defined um, um, what I mean as as promotion. Um, that has been left purely to Scottish ministers um, and the government of the day to decide. Um, what means um, how how much money they spend on promotion, how they do it? That's that's been left to to ministers. No, I realise you ha you haven't defined it, and that's, that's why I'm asking. Because you know, if it's if the bill is passed as it stands, the Scottish ministers are to promote and they're to fil facilitate the promotion of the use and understanding of BSL. Um, how would we recognise it? How would we know that they have they have actually um, undertaken their duties? to a sufficient level if we're not got an equal understanding of what promotion is? I think it will be up to the, the government of the day exactly how much money, how much resources they put into promotion of the bill. I've set out what I think um, should be done um, as a standard in terms of producing a national plan um, with a, a, a national set a set of national indicators, a national um, guidance as to what public bodies um, should do to, com to comply with the plan to increase awareness and access uh, to services in BSL. Um, but it's going to be up to the government of the day as to um, what exactly they do. I'm, I'm, I'm going to push you again on this because I think this is important. If the government of the day publishes its national plan, is that they met their duty to promote the language? In, in terms of the bill, they will have met the, the first part of their duty in producing a national plan um, and also in promotion by identifying a minister with responsibility um, for British Sign Language. But that, that's not the end of um, the actions. There's then a performance review to make sure that the government themselves and public bodies um, haven't just produced a, a plan and then uh, let it gather dust on a shelf that they have actually, um, in, in their plans they have uh, outcomes, um, timetables and a performance review which would pick those up at the end of the cycle to make sure that they've actually done what they would say, they said they would do. I'm sorry, but I mean, is, is a performance review promotion? I wouldn't have thought so. I would have thought promotion was something different. Yeah. Yep, promotion is part uh, is one of the obligations um, which the minister will have to undertake. A performance review um, will come at the end um, to see whether they've met 
and the standards that the government and public bodies have, have set themselves on promotion. Hmm. Um, Chick. Good morning. Uh, I'm confused. Uh, <clears throat> the, the intention of the bill for which you, your action should be commended is, is yeah, without question. But just following on from the previous question, we, we, we've already had, since the well, last 14 years, a working group that's been working with the Scottish Government to improve linguistic uh, the access for deaf people. Now, we now talk about the Government in memorandum on the bill proposing a national advisory group. What promotion has there been? Now, if I put this in a, in a business sense, forgive me, but if I have a marketing director, his job is to promote what I'm trying to sell, and then I have an operational director who has to make it happen. Can you tell me what drive has there been to promote, to, to, to market, to sell uh, the uh, BSL over the last 14 years? And how do you see the National Advisory Body uh, complementing that or indeed replacing it? I mean, the government recognised BSL, um, officially recognised BSL in, in 2011 in terms of um, public announcements, public promotion of, of BSL in a, in a big nationally coordinated way. Um, I can't see anything else that um, has happened to, to boost it on that front. Um, I think through the the consultation that I carried out that um, members of the BSL community felt that legislation was the way to go, that this was a, a big, bold statement by the Scottish Parliament and the, the Scottish Government, if they were to support, um, that they valued the British Sign Language as a language, um, as a culture, and that that would go um, a way towards um, showing how valued and how supported it was, and then go on to, to further promote it. I think on the issue of of the groups, I think we heard in the, the previous session that the the BSL Linguistic Access Working Group that was set up um, for, a, for a different purpose than this. It, it covered um, a whole spectrum um, of deafness um, rather than the primary focus been on, on British Sign Language. It doesn't have the public bodies who would be expected to implement some of these plans. And so it's, in my initial thinking, I thought that that body could effectively be um, transplanted into an, an advisory group and that would be a way of um, saving money but in, in discussion and getting into the detail of how that national body would operate. I think the government are right to set up a new uh, national advisory group. Um, I think that's needed and is right to get the public bodies um, on that board who would be tasked um, with implementing some of the, the objectives set out in the national plan for them to be um, properly involved and in, in, to have buy-in um, and a commitment to, to deliver on those objectives. Uh, okay, uh, and I hear your point about saving money, but that, you know, frankly, from a personal point of view at this moment in time, it's, a, it's, it's not about that. It's about creating a much wider uh, awareness of what you're trying to achieve. Um, in the last 14 years, technology has moved on hugely. And yet, if I, you know, we're looking for promotion uh, of the wider uh, cultural requirements, I'd have looked at how, when we talked about this with the minister this morning, about uh, we have call centres for those that are not deaf, and yet we've taken no steps in promotion of, of the, the, cult, the, 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 the deafness community in terms of making sure that technology is actually helping them, like you know, using Skype or remote uh, you know, validation of questions that they may, may have of the public services. So why is it going to be any... What makes you think it's going to be different in terms of using that to, pr to promote to sell the issue? I, mean, I think it's two, two separate things here. I mean, there have been uses of technology by the Scottish Government. They have used 
um, an online um, video interpreter service for NHS 24. That's been in operation for a while now, and they're now uh, the Scottish Government are now rolling that out to, to other public services. Um, I think that has been promoted within the BSL community so that BSL users know that service exists. Um, and that's about promoting a particular service that is of use to BSL users, to people who use BSL. What the bill is talking about as well is a, is a wider promotion um, of BSL as a language and a culture, and that rather than promoting the availability of services as well, that we're promoting the value of BSL users as a, a culture um, to, to wider Scotland. I mean, the, the educational attainment issues, um, the underemployment issues that face um, BSL users, that face deaf people, that actually making sure that we value that um, community on an economic basis, on a cultural basis, um, is different, I think, from promoting an individual service which is focused purely on, on BSL. I mean, promotion covers all spectrum, but I mean, this is where my confusion is. It comes back to the business of promotion and the bodies that promote it and how we, and somebody will come back on how you review the performance, all of these things. We can say, right, we've promoted it, but at the end of the day, it's the outcomes that were, you know, improved outcomes that we're looking for. Yeah, but I think that comes, uh, that comes through improved promotion. If, if you're telling a, a health board or a public or a local authority that, um, that they... So you use the word tell. But, uh, if, you, if you're telling, I'm not, I'm not saying that you're telling them what to do. If you're telling them or informing them about the issues facing a particular BSL user, um, issues related to educational attainment, about access to jobs market, about um, mental health because of isolation. If you're informing a, a public body about those issues and the costs that are going to fall on those public bodies um, down the line in terms of increased benefit payments, increased access to, to medical services for, for mental health, that's a, a promotion of the issues around about BSL and the actions that public bodies will need to undertake to make sure that they get service delivery right, so that then down the line um, that you're actually saving money and reducing some of that, that burden later on. I think that's part of uh, promotion as well. Okay, thank you. Okay, just clear up one tiny point. In, in your earlier answer um, to Mr Brodie, you said that the, ministers, the bill says the ministers have to promote uh, BSL and the culture. I, I'm not aware that anywhere in the face of the bill it says they have to promote the culture. It is just BSL. Yep, sorry, it was, I mean, it was to promote the, the use and understanding of the sign language known as British Sign Language. Yep, sorry. So it's just, it's just for clarity. Okay, Liam MacArthur. I mean, I think just on that, because I, I think we're all aware that there's the letter of the law and there's the spirit of the law. Uh, and, and whatever we, we, we enact through this process, um, I think the expectation will be um, that it's approached in good faith um, and, and presumably. The, the intention is that um, over time promotion will mean very different things, whether through technological advances that allow us to do things in different ways or because the baseline of where we're at is different and therefore what is needed in, in terms of promoting it beyond that is different from what it was uh, previously. Is that something um, that that you see as, uh, as reflecting the idea of, of, of not defining promotion uh, too rigidly, uh, but also a role for the National Advisory Committee, in a sense, to keep feet to the fire um, over successive years and, and, and as the need for prom promotion may, may change and the opportunities for doing so may change. Yeah, but, uh, yeah that's exactly it. We have a, a low baseline um, and we're looking for um, continuous improvement, continuous promotion. That's why that it hasn't been prescriptive in terms of promotion, it hasn't been prescriptive in terms of what would be included in, in national plans, because, like you said, um, starting from a, a low baseline, there's a, a set of actions that government um, might wish to take um, to, to take us on to the next level, and the, then be a performance review, a reflection on what has worked and what hasn't worked, and then another a revision and revision and revision um, as we go through um, the cycle of um, plans and reviews. So exactly... 
as you've set out. It's about uh, giving that flexibility to to review what exactly has has gone on and reflect in, in the next cycle. Presumably you'll be encouraged that even without that specific reference to promoting the culture of BSL, in his opening remarks to the committee this morning, the Minister made um, very specific proactive reference to the need to, to promote and recognise BSL um, uh, both as its own language and with its own um, cultural identity as well. So in a sense, the Bill is already achieving some of that even before we've enacted it. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the language and the, and the culture themselves go, go hand in hand. Um, and like I said, I did welcome the, the Minister's comments. The Government clearly have a very good and, um, appreciation and understanding of um, the BSL community and um, the culture um, of deaf and um, particularly deaf BSL users. Um, so I welcome that, yeah. Yeah, and just finally, on, on the issue again, it was raised. I raised it with the minister this morning. Do you see the need to specifically refer to the needs of deaf-blind um, community within the bill, um, or is that something that maybe is better reflected in the national plan and more tailored um, uh, arrangements for meeting their needs and their aspirations uh, that sort of delivered through that route? Yep. In, in drafting, when when I talk about BSL of British Sign Language that encompasses um, all users of British Sign Language, whether they are hearing, deaf, and deaf blind, um, that's intended to cover all of it. But I know there are particular dif difficulties um, around people who are deaf and use British Sign Language and then go on um, to, be to become blind as well. Um, I'm in discussions with Deaf Blind Scotland um, as to whether there's a, a, a particular amendment that we can look at to to bring that onto the face of the bill um, but even if we don't manage to to come up with an idea like that I'm still um, reassured by uh, the minister and what he said about including um, making sure that uh, deaf blind people were per in particular were res represented on the advisory body okay Thanks. I'm sorry to pick this up again but you, you've just said that um, uh, what you mean by BSL includes um, those who are deafblind, but again, there's no definition of that. I mean, that wasn't that wasn't my understanding necessarily. I mean, it may be, it may well be what grows out of this and what happens, and it may well be what public bodies do, but there's no definition of what BSL is in the bill. Um, no, there's no no definition. It's the common um, use of of signing, and um, that's whether that's um, hands-on signing for deaf-blind people or, or how other deaf BSL users would interpret that Absolutely. as a common. Are you, are you saying that those who, those who are deaf-blind, um, what they're using is, is, is defined as BSL? It, it's, a for, it's, a, yep, it's a form of British Sign Language. Is it? OK. Thank you. No, thank you for that. Um, Mary Scanlon. Thank you. Um, can, I, can I first of all uh, pay credit to your motivation behind this bill? And I do understand that uh, family background and family experience is one of the, the best motivations that any of us have. So uh, well done for getting to this stage. Can I just uh, ask you, Mark, um, I don't know if you heard the questioning to the Minister, but um, can you just uh, explain briefly what will this bill provide that's not currently available. In term, are you talk about in terms of services. What? Yes. Just uh, you know, what, what are we achieving with this bill that's not currently available? But there's currently no national plan for British Sign Language. Currently, public bodies aren't obliged to produce um, plans for how they deliver services to British Sign Language users. So, on in terms of direct impact of this bill, that will be what is produced. Um, but in the plans themselves, then obviously I would expect um, government public bodies to set out uh, exactly their priorities for how they would provide services, how they would promote British Sign Language within their own um, budgets and according to local needs. <laughs> Okay, what we've heard today is that uh, local public authorities will not all be producing a plan, it will be one national plan that will take into account uh, what uh, local authorities will do. I'm just concerned that it doesn't become a tick box exercise 
and a bureaucratic exercise. You know, I, I want to satisfy myself that this bill will bring forward progress in terms of support and services for deaf people. So that really took me to the policy memorandum, uh, paragraph 10. So in August 2009, we had the working group published a report, The Long and Winding Road, a Roadmap to British Sign Language and Ling Linguistic Access. So we actually have a report, call it a report or call it a plan, but there are, in paragraph 11, uh, eight recommendations, which I, I, I won't read out. I'm sure you're familiar with them. But coincidentally, that was six years ago. So we have a report six years ago, which will be the time frame for your plan. I wonder if you can tell me how many of these eight recommendations do you feel that uh, progress has been made or, you know, has this previous report been a success in terms of implementation? Um, I think uh, the fact that I've got a, a bill and putting things on a statutory footing is really um, my answer that I don't think... Uh, well, well, the, the body of work was excellent. The recommendations are excellent. If those recommendations had been implemented and improvement was being made in terms of um, support for families with deaf children, um, deaf attainment, um, public services being deaf and, and deaf blind aware. If those um, recommendations were, were being met, I'd be um, more than happy with the progress and wouldn't see the need um, for this bill. Can I go back to the first point that you made? And it was maybe um, the, the, the discussion in the previous session, the, the minister, I don't know whether it came across across properly, but the Minister was just talking about um, bodies that were under the di direct control of government and with ministerial direction that they would subsume into the national plan, but public authorities, yeah. health boards, local authorities yeah. would still produce um, their own plans even under the, um, the, the amended version proposed, proposed by government. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you for that. Um, I was actually hoping that you would say, say that because, you know, we've had this report in all good faith. The recommendations are excellent. It seems to cover a wide range of issues. Now, six years later, if you're saying the progress has been slow, if, if that's fair, how do we know that uh, the plan that you're bringing forward six years later we could be sitting here thinking, you know, in 2021, uh, <laughs> and we're saying, well, not much has happened there. So, you know, I asked the minister, what if people just say, I'll make progress here, 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 and here, I'll do this, but they do nothing. So six, we've got another six years, if you like, wasted, with no further progress. And I'm really, look at, I'm really trying to get an answer as to... I'm not asking you to, you know, bring out sticks rather than carrots, but we've already had the carrot here and nothing's worked. So what is it about your bill that will ensure the deaf community? And I appreciate there's quite a few members in the audience today, and I'm sure they're looking for an assurance that this will be more meaningful in terms of services and support. But I, I'm not seeing how this can be guaranteed to make progress when what we have from six years ago hasn't made much progress. Yep. I mean, that, that has been a, a standalone piece of work. What I'm proposing here is the, the national plan um, where public bodies set out their priorities. Um, that, that's included in, on the face of the bill that... Um, so in section three, um, subsection... Um, four, um, subsection three and four, where it sets out exactly um, what public bodies are expected to include in their plan, um, the outcomes, um, time scales, and then yeah. um, at the end of the, the sessions for, for those public bodies to provide a, a performance review on exactly where they are with the outcomes that they agreed in their, or, their own plans. Um, so that's something that is, is in addition that um, the public themselves 
will have access to um, a performance review to be able to hold um, a public, if that's a, a local authority, to be able to hold their local authority to account. A minister will be able to hold a, a public body and, and that the Scottish Government have um, authority over as to why in their performance review they haven't met the ambitions and the aims of their um, plan that they had drafted six years earlier. Well, it, it is my final point, uh, uh, convener, but I do think there's quite a good analogy here, and that's the single outcome agreements in local authorities. Now, I've been concerned about care of the elderly, home care, mental health, and various other issues in the Highlands. I, and I've looked at the single outcome agreements, I think it's about four to six inches deep. And what you find is, I'll give you an example, we will make progress on uh, reducing class sizes. So maybe one school in Drumnadrochet has one class with one less pupil. That's progress. You know, and what I'm scared of, what I'm frightened of, is that you know, we may be raising expectations, and I just want to make sure that these expectations are, are achieved. I, and I've seen too many recommendations that haven't been fulfilled. There's no sanctions. They will be offered an opinion. You know, well, I'm sorry, you've got another six years to make it better. Meantime, generations are losing out. I'm just wondering, perhaps I can ask, is there something that we could bring forward at stage two that would make these plans, the implementation of these plans, more successful, more robust and uh, more user-friendly and more supportive to the deaf community? Um, I mean, there already is an amendment at, that the, the government are proposing around um, consulting on public bodies' plans and consulting and translating um, into BSL that I think is a, a strengthening. But the, the main way of making sure that public bodies do what they, they say they'll do in, in public and their, and their plans um, will be down to the, the deaf community um, scrutinising those plans, scrutinising the performance um, and an element of, of naming and shaming and reputational risk to a public body of not um, carrying out the, the services that their functions in a Check, way that... The checks and balances are uh, not with parliamentarians but actually for the deaf community to come forward a name and shame. So, well, it'd be a performance. There'd be a performance review. The authorities would review their own performance, feed that back into a national performance review, um, and the deaf community are able to uh, lobby the the minister, lobby their own, um, whether that's a local authority, lobby their own councillor. If that's a, a a national body, lobby their MSP. That that particular public body would be named and shamed, and I would hope that would be enough of a, a damage, the prospect of a damage to a reputation to make sure that um, they carried out the actions that they um, agreed and set themselves. Okay, thank you. Colin Thank you, Vera. Um, at the core of this bill is the requirement for a national plan and also for uh, listed authorities to produce a plan. Now, clearly, these plans must have some um, aspiration within them. So there must be some cost attached to that. Will public authorities be expected to meet these demands? Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't expect a public body to, to draft a plan um, with uh, wildly ambitious um, promises to the deaf community that they couldn't deliver on. Um, I would expect a public body to produce a, a plan that was costed and that they could meet within their own budget. So the responsibility would be on the local authority? And, unless government may choose that a particular yeah. um, area needed national attention, national focus and provide funding um, from central government on a particular area, but I would expect a, a public body and sensibly managing their finances to fully cost any, any plan that they produce. I mean, the content of any plan that's produced is going to be 
vitally important towards achieving the objectives of the bill. What, what, what uh, specific things would you anticipate or expect to see in the, in the uh, plan? I mean, I've deliberately left that to government to be, to be flexible, carrying on from the point that Liam MacArthur made that progress will be ongoing and priorities will change. Um, I've deliberately left that um, to the government to set out there what they are willing to prioritise, what they are willing to fund. And also, um, I, I think the point the minister made in the previous session was the one that I would rely on as well, that it's going to be up to um, the BSL community themselves to set out their own priorities for what should be on the national plan. Do you have any expectations yourself? Is there anything that, just, you, know, that you would see at the front of your mind as being obvious content? I mean, one of the obvious things to me would be um, attainment, um, attainment for deaf pupils and access to services for the BSL community in, in general. But like I say, they are um, my own interpretation. And um, you can be sure when it comes to consultation on the national plan that I will make my own submission. OK. Um, just one question in this area uh, from myself. Uh, Mark, if you don't mind, I just wondered what your view was about the possibility of public authorities being allowed to deviate uh, from the national plan. I mean, the, the specific wording in the bill is for um, public bodies to try to achieve consistency. That's been um, specifically worded to give public bodies the, the flexibility to adapt to their own local circumstances. Um, obviously, I, you'll have the, the national plan. Parts of that will apply to local authorities, health boards, um, which won't apply to um, the police service or, or fire board. Um, so I think it's right that there is a, a degree of flexibility. Again, so that um, it's clear that a local authority is drafting their own plan with the needs of their own community in mind. Um, do you think it's the, the bill is, as currently drafted is sufficiently clear to allow deviation by a, a public authority um, from the national plan, or do you think further amendment is required? Um, I, I think the, the word in there to, to try to achieve consistency is, is clear. It's not... Um, an outright obligation to um, duplicate the, the findings. Um, in particular, section 3, 4, um, 2, there's a line on um, that public bodies would have regard in drafting their plans for um, the potential for developing the use of British Sign Language in connection with the exercise um, of their own functions, um, which gives um, authorities to, to specifically tailor, tailor their plans to their own needs. I think we'd all welcome the ability of public authorities because of the, the variation um, that you mentioned between bodies, their responsibilities, and of course just geography and, 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 you know, and different communities. So I accept that. But I'm just wondering whether the flip side of that, the question would be, do you, do you believe it's, it's firm enough? I mean, is trying to achieve consistency sufficiently strong to ensure that you know, we do get, at the very least, a base level of consistency across the country? Yeah. I mean, if they, if they come back and said, we did try, but we failed. I mean, I, th I think there'll be a set of recommendations in the national plan that will apply to, to all public bodies that, will, that they would be expected to, to meet as a minimum. Um, as in, one of the, the recommendations that was in the report that Mary Scanlon mentioned about staff being deaf and deafblind aware, in particular recommendations that would apply to, to all public bodies while leaving that flexibility um, to, to tailor their plans around particular services. OK, thank you very much. Uh, Liam MacArthur. Following up on that, um, you may have heard uh, Mark earlier on the exchange with the Minister in relation to, to trying to streamline the process of of consultation and having a national plan that kind of sits above a range of public authorities. I was interested in the responses to, to the convener's questions there, where 
it would be tailored. Each um, pu public body would, would need to tailor um, a, a plan to, to, to reflect their circumstances, etc., and the needs of the deaf uh, community in relation to the way they engage with that uh, agency. But from what the Minister was suggesting, that, that there's potentially a risk there that if you have an overarching umbrella, um, there may be some sort of uh, key th um, principles and themes that, that emerge through that, but not necessarily the more nuanced or perhaps substantively different um, a, a, a approach, because each of the authorities won't necessarily have either its own plan or its own its own statement. Is that something that you've been in discussion with the minister about? Is it something you're, you, you're comfortable with the government's suggested approach? Yeah, I've been I've been comfortable in principle with all of the government's um, amendments and we've been in discussions just around um, the detail as to how we go about um, drafting those amendments and whether, when we get down to the fine detail, whether they're acceptable. In principle, um, I'm happy uh, with the, the government's amendments that have been proposed so far. Right. Okay. In terms of the performance review, you touched on it earlier on. I mean, I, I think from the outset, we've been very um, conscious as a, as a committee of um, the, the risk of, of expectations about what the bill will achieve, exceeding what it um, is ever likely um, to achieve. And I think what's been encouraging is that the, the, the engagement, the evidence we've had from the deaf community suggests a high level of awareness um, uh, 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 and, uh, uh, and understanding of, of, of precisely what it is that the, the, the bill will do. But in terms of the, the, the performance review, again, from the exchange with the minister, it's kind of unlike, perhaps, um, the, the type of performance review that um, organisations would be uh, expected to adhere to. We don't have a great um, level of baseline data. Um, so that process of data gathering is going to fall to each of the organisations, in a sense, be collected um, centrally assessed by the, the National Advisory Group. How do you envisage that process taking place? I mean, is it ever likely to give us the sort of detailed picture of where the strengths are, where the weaknesses are? Um, or, or are we kind of feeling our way here? What, what's, what's your take? I mean, I think on your first point, I, um, I don't want to blow my own trumpet here, but it has been four years of careful... Uh, expectation management with the, the BSL community, make, making sure that they knew that this bill wasn't um, simply waving a magic wand, that this was uh, the first step um, in getting a, a cycle of continuous Im improvement, and I think that's been, that's been taken on board and recognised. Um, I think the fact that we do have such um, poor baseline data is another motivation um, for me bringing this bill forward. I mean, we don't actually know um, how many BSL users there are in Scotland. It's, it's a vague estimate based on um, census figures and there's an issue with the census in that it's carried out in written English um, which not all BSL users are able to, to complete and return. Um, so that, that baseline information not being there is, like I said, one of the, the drivers for introducing the bill. What I hope will will become, so become the baseline as the first national plan and the first authority plan. That will be, then be the baseline. Um, the objectives, the timescales that are in those first um, national and, and local plans then become the baseline to measure any performance review against. I mean, do you see the importance of having um, uh, centrally available um, statistics on, on how different authorities are, are performing or is it more important that at a, a, a local or a regional level that what you have is a, is a detailed picture of, um, of what's happening what's, and, and importantly probably what's not happening as well or is it a combination of both? Yeah, I mean I think both national and um, regional or, or local bodies need to have a, a picture of what their population is um, so that they can plan their budgets, plan their services um, accordingly and that's I, I think a, a part, of a, part of the feeling out there that um, the needs of that particular community haven't been fully identified or we would know exactly um, how many 
um, the FBSL users that there were in Scotland. Um, that challenge function from the either from the deaf community itself or from national advisory group um, drill down into a, a local situation. I mean, there'll be areas of the country where the the deaf community is is, is well mobilised, perhaps as a result of the process leading up to to this bill. That's that, that 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 that's formed to a greater extent. In other parts of the country, that may not be the case, and that therefore the the pressure, the challenge function on local authorities and public bodies in those areas is not necessarily as intense. And as a result, the the the, the services that are available, the the extent to which BSL is 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 promoted and and. and supported is, is less as a consequence. Is there a, do you see a, a national role for ensuring that there's a, some level of consistency across the country? Yeah, I mean, that, that is the issue where areas in the, the central belt where that's, there's that critical mass um, of BSL users who are able to, to challenge service providers um, when in other more rural areas when there isn't that density um, that some feel that they, they aren't able to, to collectively challenge um, on the services being provided. That's why the national um, review, I think, is, is needed, so that um, ourselves as representatives, um, whether that's the BDA, the um, Scottish Council on Deafness, and other national bodies are able to um, do the job that their members expect them to do and scrutinise national performance and performance of, of other public bodies that that performance review is critical to making sure that that challenge is able to be made. Right. Okay. Um, Mary Scanlon, supplementary. Uh, just a very brief question, uh, uh, Mark. We've heard several times today from the Minister and from yourself that there is no baseline performance data on which to measure progress and the official with the Minister said it would take at least two years to set up the first national plan because there's no uh, baseline data. So in 2009, this the long and winding road, a roadmap to British Sign Language and Linguistic Access in Scotland, eight recommendations were made. So really, if we've not got any baseline data now, presumably we didn't have any baseline data in 2009. Therefore, Am I right in saying we've got no idea whether any of these eight recommendations have been achieved, are being achieved, or even if we're making any progress? Is that fair? Um, uh, you're maybe not the right one to ask, but I thought, uh, I thought your opinion may be helpful. Yeah. I mean, an, an indicate, I can give you an example of this. When I first started working on this bill, and we tried to find out how many BSL users there were in Scotland, we got an estimate of around about 6,000. 6, and that, those were the numbers that informed that previous document. And we had the latest census figures, which put it at about 12,000. Um, so you've got a jump. For, you've got quite, quite a jump and just an indication of um, how difficult it's been to identify um, just how many BSL users that there are in the country and then the knock-on difficulties for providing services and um, providing a, a baseline, as you, as you say. But, but my point is that we cannot measure any progress, it seems to me, in the 2009 recommendations because there were no baseline figures. So it would appear to me to be a fairly meaningless exercise. Or do you think that some progress, perhaps anecdotally, if nothing else, has been made? My concern is that where we're going, we need to be much more robust going forward than where we've been in the past. And is this an example of uh, a well-meaning report, but I mean, it, it's achieved nothing? Maybe it, it does. The report does give strong recommendations. I think it's up to the government to answer to whether those recommendations. Um, have been fully implemented. But if you don't know the but, baseline, yeah. you don't know where you're going. Yeah. One supplementary, that's the th that's okay. third go at it. Sorry. So, um, um, I'm going to move on because we've got other people to, who want to come in. Uh, Gordon. Thanks very much. Uh, Mark, I want to ask you about uh, the financial memorandum. Um, in the original financial memorandum, you estimated that the cost would be roughly 20 to 30,000 per authority. 
Coslas came back and said it should be roughly 40,000, and that's just for implementing the plans. Scottish uh, Government has come in and said that over the four-year period, as the bill currently stands, it would be about 6.1 million. Um, is it your intention, in light of discussions you have had with the Scottish Government, to update the financial memorandum? Yep. I think if, if, as a result of amendments, that um, the costings associated with the bill substantially change, I think it is in standing orders that I have to provide an updated financial memorandum. So, if that is the case, then that will be provided. Right. And do you have a, a, a better handle on what the cost would be if the amendment to have just say one national plan would be? Um, I mean, there only ever would be one one national plan. So yeah, but how it's in, you know if it's done on a regional basis, where a lot of authorities sign up to whatever the regional element of that plan would be, have you got any any estimate of what the cost would be? We haven't done any work on any amendments. Um, the financial memorandum provided provides a cost for the bill as it stands. Um, we'd need to go away and do um, further work if there was a, a revised financial memorandum required. Right. The, the bill, again, as it currently stands, does not include the cost of implementing the actions set out in the plans. Um, and given that you obviously expect a level of promotion, even if it's just minimum, uh, are you intending to um, estimate the potential cost of implementing the promotional activity within public authorities? Um, that will be for public bodies. They only need to set their own priorities within their own budgets. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the financial memorandum sets out exactly um, the cost impact of the bill itself. I'm not in a position to put an estimate on what a local authority or what a health board um, would choose um, to do. Yeah, but, but you've you said in earlier answers that you expect a cycle of continuous improvement. Um, can you highlight what kinds of continuous improvement don't have cost implications? There's no doubt that any, if a public body chooses to say um, a local authority chooses to provide um, BSL classes to parents of a, of a deaf child, just 90 per cent of um, deaf children are born to hearing parents. So if, if a public authority, if a local authority decided to provide classes, then obviously there's going to be a cost associated with that. There's, I've not done any work at all um, on the, the costings of a particular um, policy, um, because that's just one example. There could be a whole suite um, of improvements that a particular authority could choose to make, and I can't go into estimations of whatever those policies would cost on the basis that they may or may not include them in their, in their plans. Right. And my, my final question is, the bill as published does not include any requirement for plans to be produced in the BSL format, and the financial memorandum does not include the cost of publication in multiple formats. Should that omission be rectified uh, in, the, in the bill itself, and should the financial memorandum be updated to reflect that? Um, I think this is this is basically because it's a, a private member's bill, and um, with in the knowledge that the the lowest cost available is more um, is most likely to be supported and passed by the government, and so um, with that in mind, that that was um, omitted to keep costs as low as possible. Um, the government have suggested that amendment that all plans and consultations should be translated into BSL. That, that's fantastic. I'm happy that they're um, willing to um, propose that amendment to improve the, the bill. OK, thanks very much. Um, I'm a bit confused by that last answer. Um, my understanding of financial memorandums are not to, to keep the cost as low as possible so that the parliament will pass it and it's acceptable to the government. The purpose of financial memorandums are to estimate the proper costs to the public purse of a bill. Um, so, sorry for any misunderstanding. I was talking about the bill itself um, being designed in such a way as the, the costs would be kept low. I'm not talking about um, artificially um, amending the financial memorandum to make that as, the cost as low as possible. I'm talking about um, the bill itself and the provisions within the bill being designed in, in such a way as to keep the cost as low as possible. Okay, that helps clarify that a little bit. Just on the basis, though, of 
what you've just said. The bill itself, your estimated costs are two and a half, somewhere around about there. Uh, the government says it's six million. Um, now, that's based on your bill. Okay, it's not about exactly what's in the bill, but it's what, what will inevitably follow if the bill is passed. Yes? If, if the government amendments are passed, then they are... Um... No, no, sorry, I'm not, I'm not talking about the amendments. I'm, I'm talking about, for, ex for example, yeah. um, uh, the translation services, the cost of translation. I mean, it's, it's, it's inconceivable, even though it's not in the bill that they have to translate everything into BSL, it's inconceivable that they would not do so. And therefore, although it's not in the bill, surely it's, it's an absolutely obvious and inevitable cost of passing the bill. Yep. Yep. Uh, if... The, if. If they were willing to do that, then and you'd expect they would be so. So yes. Well, that, I think that's, and I think that's why some of us are puzzled a little bit about the the financial memorandum. What, of course, the finance committee have said, um, and your answers about uh, the financial memorandum is what's based, on what's in the bill, because clearly there are there are costs which the government have identified, which inevitably follow from the bill, even an amended bill, uh, passing into law. Surely that should have been included in a financial memorandum, um, and I'm just wondering why it hasn't been. I'll, I'll bring Joanna. Please, yes, yeah, um, It goes back to the, the scope and the ambition of a, a member's bill. They're not, they're not government bills, and they, they do have a different character, as Mark said. Um, and secondly, the... Um, Mark's responsibility under the standing orders is to bring forward a uh, financial memorandum that costs everything that is on the face of the bill. And there, there was a debate uh, during the development of the policy about whether um, bodies should be compelled to translate everything. And the decision came down on, on the side of, of, of not doing that at that point in time because of consideration of... Um, financial resources and availability of interpreters and translators and so on. Um, and so for various uh, interlinked policy reasons, it was decided that the bill would be silent on the, um, the question of translation. And the government um, are, have shown that they're willing, um, they believe that plans should be um, translated and consultation should take place um, using BSL, and Mark's very uh, happy to welcome that, but it, it wasn't quite proper to, to um, envisage what kinds of costs might come on the back of the bill that weren't on, on the face of the bill and set those out in the financial memorandum. But it, it's, it's always a, a slightly fine line, um, and that's, that's the reason we, we ended up with the memorandum looking the way it does. Well, obviously, I appreciate you know, there's no compulsion to translate... Um, uh, plans, etc. But I just, I mean, I, I think it's almost a kind of, as night follows day, obvious that, you know, I mean, I cannot imagine um, that you wouldn't do so. That's why I'm, I, and I understand the point you're making about members' bills and, you know, the fine line there, but I'm just wondering if something is absolutely inevitable, it would seem to me um, that you should have put the stuff in. I think Mark has many, many ambitions that, that could, this bill could have been ten times the length, but it had to be a starting point. It had to be realistic and achievable. Um, and I, I, I disagree slightly that um, it's inevitable that uh, consultation and translation, um, you know, the BSL would be deployed for those. But you're right, it does fall, fall very much into the, the highly likely, highly desirable category. OK, uh, Liam? Yeah. Again, you will have heard um, me expressing... Um, a degree of interest in the in the approach um, to financial memoranda in, in, in relation to a member's bill compared to the government's bill. And, and, and there is a sense that the Scottish Government have, have rather thrown the kitchen sink at, at the costings of, of this bill in a way that um, with, with government bills um, we are uh, invariably um, trying to tease out of them an um, uh, impression as to whether or not these, these costs are um, at the upper end of what is what is likely, but but to some extent, um, obviously we're, we're dealing with a bill here which may change quite um, substantially 
if uh, the amendments that the, the government are proposing are, are taken uh, on board. But some of the, the costings here, um, the Scottish Government are, are, are suggesting 140,000 in the first session of Scottish Government cost, uh, 100,000, up to 100,000 in subsequent years. Do you have a, a, from the discussions with the Scottish Government, do you have a sense as to what those additional costs are? Because in response to questions from, I think it was Mary Scanlon, the Minister was suggesting that there wasn't a great deal that, that the bill was requiring of them that they aren't really already doing. I haven't had any discussions with them in terms of discrepancies between the the two cost estimates, it's, it's purely been on the basis of um, amendments to the bill. Um, the reason for that really has been that because of the level of costs associated with the bill that um, the government will have to table a financial resolution, um, which a government minister will have to propose. Um, so it was an assumption on my part that if they are supporting the bill that they will have to table their own financial resolution and be supportive of the, the costs that will be incurred. And presumably in relation to the financial memorandum, I, again, I think it was the Minister who made clear that, that the estimates are in relation to the bill itself rather than any knock-on implications for service delivery. But it would be fair to say that um, one of the um, not just happy coincidences, but presumably one would hope the inevitable consequences of passing this sort of legislation is that issues in relation to allowing individuals to fulfil their full potential and all the rest of it don't come at a cost. Actually, they uh, are a saving to the public purse across a range of, of different um, areas. Is that that would be your assumption too? Yep, exactly. You'd have um, hopefully an ambition realised where um, people wouldn't be underemployed, people would be achieving their full potential, earning, um, earning accordingly, contributing to... Uh, tax revenues, um, issues of isolation and the mental health issues associated that um, wouldn't be as prevalent and would be a lower burden on um, the NHS. So, yep, if this is, if this is done properly, um, then, then there should be savings to the public purse and increased taxation revenue. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm going to have to go back to the financial memorandum again. I've never had a chance to look at standing orders. Um, and it seems to me that, and this is, this is obviously what was concerning me in the back of my mind when you were discussing the financial memorandum, standing orders say a bill shall on introduction be accompanied by a financial memorandum which shall set out the best estimates of the administrative compliance and other costs to which the provisions of the bill would give rise. Now that seems to me that the, you know, the, the, the bill would give rise to these other costs that the, the government has identified and therefore should have been in the financial memorandum. Are you disagreeing with that? Is that, is that not your interpretation of what, what the standing orders say? Um, I'll, I'll take that. Um, I think what the government do in their memorandum is um, identify a number of desirables. They also set out um, some activity that's already taking place. And then they come up with a global figure, which isn't necessarily at odds with what's in the financial memorandum. And I, th I think also they've identified a number of areas where cost savings and efficiencies will be achievable through collective consultation and so on. And it's not until those amendments are, are properly drafted and explored and then recosted that we can ever hope to come up with a, a final um, figure. But, but I'm very satisfied that the financial memorandum <clears throat> did what it was supposed to do, and that is um, cost the provisions that, that are an, an absolute um, necessity under the bill, and that is the production of a national plan, the production of local plans, and a degree of consultation. Well, my interpretation of the standing orders would have been that, that the phrase would give, the bill would give rise would have covered the bits that are not. I, th I think um, one of the witnesses at the last session put um, put it very succinctly when he, he said that what the bill is asking bodies to do is look at their resources and state within those resources what they will do to the, achieve the, the um, aims of the bill. Um, and this, is, this, always, this has always had to be the starting point um, for a member's bill um, because it isn't backed with... Um, uh, you know, it's not a government aspiration at the moment. Um, and it, it doesn't come with a budget behind it. Therefore, 
um, the bill was drafted in a way that compelled certain authorities and bodies to, to look to their budget, state what they're already doing, state what they could do, um, th start to think about working together and provide, if you like, a public record for what's being done and, and what's planned. Sorry, Mark, did you want to add to that? Okay, thank you. Check. Yeah, I... In bringing this forward, I, I, I hear what you say. In bringing this forward, if I look at the you know, the paper that we have in terms of just taking one cost. The cost of the Scottish Government of supporting a national advisory group to support implementation of the bill. It's, it's the same number every year. So there must be, you know, in, in, in terms of the computation, I mean, for example, supporting the development of the second BSL national plan is exactly the same as supporting the, the, the development of the first BSL national plan. Now, we must have learned something from the first BSL national plan to make a yeah, a much more effective and productive development of the second national plan. Yet. And I don't know if there's inflation built in there or what prices. I mean, there has to be a supportive, meaningful supportive financial basis for, 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 the, plan, for the bill. In the financial memorandum, it set out um, where those costs come from in terms of uh, time t taken by a, a particular level of... of um, yeah. official at a public body level. Sure. We have set out a reduced cost for producing subsequent yeah, plans um, with the expectation that um, the, the bulk of the work would be done in the first plan. Um, a performance review at the end of the cycle would then inform the, the production of subsequent plans and so there would be a, a lower cost. So in the financial memorandum produced with the bill, there is um, that recognition that um, things would change at some I, I understand. Set. I apologise. These were government numbers I was looking at. But even in discussion with the government, I just understand, you know, the, the methodology that goes into all of this in terms of you, you know, supporting, supporting the, 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 the planned bill. I'll leave it there. That's more of a comment question. Just one final question, Mark, if you don't mind. Um, it's the, the questions about the cycle for publishing BSL um, plans uh, and the performance reviews. Um, obviously, there's a the difference of opinion in terms of what you've originally published and what the Minister said today. I, I wonder if you could make comment on that and what your views are. Yep. I mean, the, the reason that I had set out the, the timetable as, as it was, um, I think as I, I said at my previous, previous appearance at committee, wasn't because of any knowledge of um, cycles of, of national plans or anything else. It was purely so that um, in the first year of office, the government would produce their plan, and in the final year of office, they would review their own performance, rather than having um, cycles um, overlapping um, different governments. And I, I thought that that was the the, the best way to go. Um, obviously, the minister has experience, extensive experience of the the Gaelic Language Act, and if um, he has evidence that a, a longer cycle um, is better, then I'm. I'm happy to, to look at the detail of that evidence and open to that um, amendment. OK, thank you very much. Um, we um, appreciate very much your attendance today, Mark, uh, and your accompanying officials. Thank you very much. That indeed concludes our evidence taking at stage one. Our next step is to report our views on the bill to the Parliament, which will be followed by the stage one debate on the bill. Um, our website will provide information on the report and the debate when the information is available. So again, can I thank you very much. The, uh, next, we will consider an approach to a possible short inquiry uh, into the educational attainment of school children with sensory impairments. Um, we're going to move on to that now, but as we decided at, uh, earlier on in the meeting that uh, that will be in private, um, I'm going to now close the meeting to the public.